Hi there, and welcome to The Art of Aging, which is part of the Abundant Aging podcast series from United Church Homes. And on this show, we look at what it means to age in America and at other places around the world with positive and empowering conversations that challenge, encourage, and inspire everyone everywhere to age with abundance. Today, I'm super excited because we've got Joe Morgan on the show. Uh, Joe comes to us uh, after four successful decades of experience in um, executive leadership. He began his career as a chemical engineer and progressed to CEO and board member positions for many public and private companies. Currently, he's an entrepreneur as CEO and founder of SIY LLC, where he advises senior executives and mentors high potential future, future leaders. Driven by his purpose to help people see the unseen and do wicked awesome things with the discoveries, Joe has walked hundreds of miles with key influencers as part of the, the Dialogue Miles journey, which we're uh, going to get into on the show today. The resulting stories are part of this platform for inspiring engagement, both personally and across organization. Joe, welcome to the show. Thank you, Michael. Glad to be here. Actually, I'm going to call you Mike. My best friend's Mike, too, if that's okay. Yeah, that's you can call me Joe. Just don't, call, just don't call me Joseph. My mother called me Joseph, but... Yeah, that's another story. Maybe we'll get to that. We'll avoid the Josephs. We'll avoid the Michaels. And just a reminder that this podcast series is sponsored by United Church Homes' Ruth Frost Parker Center for Abundant Aging. To learn more about the center, including our annual symposium in October, please visit unitedchurchhomes.org slash Parker hyphen center. So, Joe, um, I always like to open up these podcasts just with the, with, with the why question, right? I mean, here, here you are. You've got decades of experience as an executive leader. You've coached executive talent. And now you've got this, this project going on with Dialogue Miles. You know, what is really driving your, your curiosity about, let's say, the world of, of, of retirement, unretirement, and really just engaging people with this particular project? Yeah, I could. This is like one of my favorite topics. Big surprise, right? So right, right. Um, I would say that it goes back a little bit into why I even established SIY. Um, SIY means something. It means be safe, be inspired, be you. And I'm, I'm a people centric leader, always have been uh, once, once I uh, got into my business career. And, and the reason for that is because my mom and dad were school teachers and all we did was talk about kids and people at the dinner table. I didn't have a lot of business experience, so I I got to talk to my sister and my grandma and my mom and dad, and it was always about the kids, and so that was really the the catalyst of what started it for me. And be safe, be inspired, be you means you know create a safe environment, inspired. I'm not big on um, motivation as much as I am on inspiration. I think you need to get out of bed in the morning, and once you do, then. I'm going to ask you, like, what are you most passionate about that you would love to spend your time on? And I'm going to inspire the hell out of you to achieve that. That's what I want to do. And then the U, capital Y-O-U, was founded on the unique attributes of people that I've been around in my life and in celebrating what's different in a positive way. Because it turns out we have a lot of things in common, not just what the world will tell us is different. We have a lot of things in common with us. So that's really what caused me to begin this journey and when I started Dialogue Miles, it honestly was called the 100 Miles of Dialogue, which originally was to walk with people that have influenced my life, that have been with me throughout my entire life. And, and, you, and you say, well, you mean physically walk. This is not oh, a Oh, no, it's physically walk. Yeah. This is actually hiking with people, walking with Hiking people. with people, walking with people. And the, the key thing for me on being people-centric is – you know, I'm not always, I'm, I'm a very sympathetic person, but empathy has been a journey for me. To really see the world as another person does is, to me, one of the hardest things in the world. If you walk shoulder to shoulder with somebody in nature, where there's no phone, there's none of this stuff, you get to see the world as they do in real time. And so what I did is I said, I'm going to meet you where you are, and I'd love to go for a walk with you. Some people said, is this your walking eulogy? And I, it's not my walking eulogy. It's not my final tour. But it really was an opportunity for me to share with people what they meant to me. And I did that. And, you know, 100 Miles was chosen by Chloe, who works for me at, at SAY. And I talked and she said, you know, why don't you set it as 100 miles? She wasn't really so sure whether I'd be able to achieve it. I walked over, over 400 miles with people that have influenced my life. You know, one of my best friends, Kevin Young, and I, walk 20 miles. And the reason we did that is because he wanted to overachieve against anyone else we walked against. So he <laughs> sure. set a high bar. 
But I, I picked the last walk in 100 Miles of Dialogue with Mike Moynihan, my best friend I've known since I was three years old. I walked with my wife. But she does. She's not a social media person. So if you watch the hundred miles of dialogue, you'll see two shadows walking <laughs> down a path. That's my wife and me. So, and I've walked with you know countless people for almost fifty people, and I miss some people too. And we're going to move that into the dialogue miles. But what would happen with dialogue miles is, I said, you know, these are influencers in my life. But what about the people that I've yet to meet? And so. I found that the Dialogue Miles platform is a bit of a disarming moment where you can actually just have a conversation about people. And I can sprinkle in some stories along the way that I think will be tingling to you because they're so impactful, but also just maybe inspire you to do something different too. But I, but I, want, I want to go back to this idea of empathy, not sympathy, because I think that's a, a lot of people may consider themselves to be an empathetic person, but I don't know how how strength tested that might be with people, right? I mean, how, how do you, what what how do you, how did you recognize that you were now achieving more of an empathetic worldview versus a sympathetic worldview? Was there something flawed? Yeah, with that? Was no. there, or, or was there? Yeah, yeah. You know, the the interesting thing about this whole situation for me was the older you get, this doesn't always happen. It did happen to me. The more honest I became about myself. I began to see the strengths I have. Certainly, I wouldn't be able to have done what I have accomplished if I didn't have certain strengths. But I also have some areas that need improvement and I need to work on. And I took a Gallup poll, not a poll, a um, Gallup behavioral analysis thing 25 years ago. And I think my lowest rated item was empathy. I was like, what? How can that be? Because I viewed myself as being you know, a caring person and all that stuff. So I went home and I asked my wife, I said, hey, Amy, her name's Amy. I said, hey, Amy, what, what do you think of this? Oh, absolutely. You're not empathetic. I'm like, really? Wow, that's a shock. So if I hadn't taken this poll, this study, I never would have had that conversation with my wife. So then I was, I was kind of bummed about it because I thought I was a different person. And then I started to think about it. And it turns out it's true. I, I tend to see things in people. I believe in people and I want them to be successful, but I don't listen necessarily or hadn't listened enough to their view on life. They may see those same things in themselves too. They may, may not know how to activate it, or maybe they don't see the need to bring those things forward. But to me, it's totally clear. But that's because it's about me. But you're also you're also a problem solver, though, Joe. I mean, that, that, that's, you're a problem solver. You've built an entire career up around leadership, and you need to not only you know support somebody in their development, but you need them to do stuff for you. You need them to attack a problem. You need to actually take action, and that doesn't necessarily lend to kind of an empathetic, um, you know, I, I, for at least for me, I don't see the direct line because you're required to be more directive to, 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 it's kind of like that, that whole, there's a, somebody told me about this philosophical theory of communitarianism, where, you know, the philosophy is, is that, you know, I will pay attention to you as a human being, you know, and, and until your actions may threaten the health of the entire community, then I have to look to the community. So if I'm leading an organization and everybody is valuable, everyone has their, their own, their own special things they bring to the table, but if they're not performing, then you know you can't be that you, you you can't you can't be fully empathetic with that. I don't I don't know. Am I making sense here? No, no, no. I I hear what you're saying. I I think again. So you asked me for some examples. So one example that comes to mind, which is a really interesting one. So um, there's a woman that I walked with. who was an influence in my life, Ashley, and we went for a walk. And she she knows a ton about nature, far more than I will probably ever know. And we're walking along, talking about a lot of different things. And she said, do you hear that? I'm like, no. I mean, and she literally like ran off the path into the woods and it was an owl because she was so in tune with where we were. She heard something. And to me, she was probably listening, as it turns out, to nature the entire time. And I missed a little bit of that. But she taught me in that moment that it's not just the person that I'm talking to that I need to be aware of. It's the environment we're in. So that's an example of empathy that to me 
we were shoulder to shoulder on this path talking about meaningful things, but I missed out on something. And it happened in another one with, I was walking with a guy, Michael, and we were pumping up this hill. And he said, do you realize what you just walked by? And I'm like, no. He said, Joe, come back here. And it was a historic thing. And he said, you know, stop and smell the roses. That was the first time in my life that I'd actually experienced that really in a real in a real way and i was like man you're right so what that's done for me is i don't have to walk fast anymore i don't i mean i my nature would be to be competitive but everything's not a competition yeah so i i've slowed the pace down when i walk with my wife i walk i try and walk at the same pace together and i experience something very very differently than i would have otherwise so that's a real life example and i think it's meta some ways metaphorical to what we should be doing in leadership is to slow it down just a little bit. Like if you really want to understand somebody, change the questions that you ask and sit on, try and sit on the other side of the table a little bit more frequently. You know, and, and this whole experience that you've led up to, this is all, this is all an exercise. It seems in gratitude, you know, really unpacking and spending quality time with the, 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 the people that you care most about. And now you want to have new conversations so who do you want to have those conversations with and, and, and what are you hoping to achieve? So it's it, it's hard to predict, to be honest. Uh, there's a little randomness to it because you meet people in your life. I was sitting in a at a bar. It sounds like a like a crazy story, but, you know, you're sitting at a bar and a hotel. But I was at an airport. My flight was a little delayed. So I was sitting in a bar having a pizza and, a, and I had a beer and um, this young woman was sitting next to me and you know, I'm a very paternal person, so I'm always very curious and careful about conversations and stuff. But we started to talk to one another, and it was really interesting where it led because she shared with me the work that she does, and I shared with her the work that I do. But what I talked about was Dialogue Miles. I didn't talk about my profession. I talked about something that I thought would connect with the work that she did. And it turns out there's a person that works in my organization that is from the same town. And I said, you know, maybe someday we might be able to take a walk and, and you could share the actual work that you do in your community with me and my, my colleague. So there's a random person out of nowhere that I would not have expected to, to talk to. And with Dialogue Miles, it used to be very centric on walking in nature. And now what I've realized, it's about the dialogue and maybe it's my miles to get there is the miles. It doesn't always have to be about walking because I've had people say to me, what if I'm impaired and I can't walk any longer or I have some a disability? Would you be willing to sit with me on a park bench? Totally, totally would be willing to do that. So to me, it's more around people that want to have a dialogue that together we could create something meaningful that would help someone else in a way. And so every time we have these conversations, we extract two or three things that we think would be usable by others. And so today, I mean, I still have a bunch of people that I didn't get to walk with during the 100 miles of dialogue and they're they're on the list and we're, we're scaling it. But now there's a bunch of other people that have reached out to me and said, hey, would you be willing to go for a walk? And I'm like, of course, absolutely, it'd be great. What do you unpack on these? I mean, so if you're if you're if, if working with somebody totally new, how do you start that experience? How do you kick it off? Where do, where does it, where does the conversation go? Well, it it's interesting because there's not a lot of stress. Like I'm a good conversationalist and I'm a good storyteller and stuff. So, and again, this is my empathy journey. I used to start with me, and now I start with you. Like, you know what I mean? I'd start, well, let me tell you about me. Yeah, I got to work on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So now I start with you. So I'll give you a really good example. So I have a, I sit on the board of a company and there's a, there's an up and coming, coming star in the organization. And I was asked to spend some time with him. So I said to him, you know, kind of give you three options. Option one, we'll go out to dinner. Option two, we can meet for a beer and we'll have a conversation. Option three is I'll pick you up at the hotel, wear your hiking stuff, we'll go to hike, and then I'll take you back to your hotel and freshen up and then we'll go out to dinner. I didn't know what he would say, but if you think about it, right, there's some 
there's something to be learned and based based on the response. What do you think he what do you think he said? I bet he shows the walk. Right. Which is not a surprise given what we're talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. So that was a little bit of leading the witness, but he he chose the walk. We walked four miles, and then he said to me, You want to have a beer? So we went and had a beer and we had further the conversation. Then I took him back, freshened up, and then we went out to a really nice dinner. But the conversation, like right out of the gate, was, you know, tell me about you. Tell me about your life. Like, what do you do for why did you choose this? Of all the options of the three options, why did you choose this? And, um, you know, once that started, we, we talked about family. We talked about, we happened to be walking around a golf course. We talked about the fact that we like to play golf. We, we talked about the business, of course, but really that was less important than getting to know one another. Because, you know, what I, what I really have discovered also, Mike, is, and I would suspect this is true. When you and I first met, we were introduced by someone that we knew in common. And you knew that person better than I, but this person, Gloria, had witnessed me in another experience and said, I think this guy might have some value in, in what we're doing. And then you and I met and you you agreed, but you really also pushed the conversation along further. And here we are today delivering on the commitment that we made. I would say in, in, the, condition, in the situation I had that I just described, it was very similar. The difference was there was nothing in between us electronically. Well, you didn't have the cues, did you? I mean, a lot, you know, you talk about a business dinner, you talk about the formality. Everyone kind of goes into this automated routine because you know you're supposed to act a certain way at a business dinner. You're supposed to talk about the what I don't know what, but you're you're removing all of those things, right? Yeah, and it's and it's not awkward. It's sort of a natural thing, you know. You um, now not everybody wants to do it. I mean, there will be people that say, geez, the last thing I want to do is put on gym clothes with somebody that I don't know very well. And I get that. And that's OK. But um, in this particular case, it, it changed everything in the relationship. And it was really good. And I would say that that's almost a, almost 100 percent of the case when I do it. And, and the other thing that I will say about this that's really important is meeting people where they are is more imp- important than inviting people to meet you where you are. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's been a big part of this as well for me as I try and ask people to set it up in a way that I can meet them where they are. Now, sometimes they'll ask me to like I have a friend that I met during COVID uh, because we have a common interest in safety and she lives in Australia. So I'm like, you know, I can't meet you in Australia, but we're going to have a, you know, a digital call, which was never my original intent, but now I'm going to be able to talk to someone in Australia as part of Dialogue Miles. And it's an amazing opportunity because we would have video calls throughout COVID talking about safety and health. And now we get a chance to talk about different things. We just have to find a time when it, when it works. Yeah. So yeah. it's pretty, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. And, I, and, and yeah, and I, I'm thinking about where you are. I mean, you, you are in your career right now. And you're still working, but you get to do this. You get to do this project. Do you find that many of your interactions, the interactions that you want to have, are those where you want to help others kind of get to that passion project? Or, you know, we've had guests on the show just really talking about retirement before and this idea of working this long life, a life in an industry, and your identity associates with that job, with that industry. And then it's over, and then we have to find something else to do, you know. And and it looks like you're you you, you seem to have projects, which is interesting. You know, you have different projects going on. Do you do you find that, um, you know, there's there's truth in that? Do you see that again and again when you're talking to people that may be in that situation? I, I do, and and I think that um, you know, everyone's a little different. And so I have a really good friend, Mark Peel, and he retired a couple of years ago, and he had a great career. And um, we did some amazing things together. And we often talk about this because he retired and and, you know, he he is a little bit older than me, but not a lot. And and he always says, you know, just wait until you get to this next phase. And it's like the difference between us is I actually decoupled from my corporate career almost eight years ago now. I wasn't I didn't stay in corporate. So I think my view on this next transition would be very different if I was in my corporate. And then I went corporate to freedom, you know, like 
what am right. I going to do with it? Well, well, yeah, whatever people think that they want. Yeah. Whatever they want. Yeah. In my case, I chose to start my own business. I said, the one thing I've never done, I've never been an entrepreneur. I've worked with tons of them. So again, going back to empathy, you think you know what it's like to be an entrepreneur until the day you wake up and there's no paycheck, there's no health care, there's nothing. And if you don't do something yourself, it's not going to come to you. So I did that. And, and it's been amazing, the most amazing re reward. So I know for myself that when I transition to a time when I don't deliver the services I do today, I feel comfortable in the sense that I have done a lot of the things that I set out to do my way. Mm -hmm. And I feel really good about that. And I, I do believe that along the way, most of the time, I would say all of the time, my heart was in the right place. My intention were in the right place. And I would say most of the time I delivered on that intention. Sometimes the circumstance caused me to not be able to do it. Or sometimes I had to make decisions that didn't feel the right way, but I was able to do it. But I do, I do think it's true. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a middle-aged guy, so I know a lot of middle-aged guys that have transitioned out. The thing that's really true the day after you leave is that there's a dramatic drop-off in connection with you because you, you have no more platform, you can't make any decisions, and it really does now come down to you and what you want out of your life. And you can get lonely pretty quickly if you haven't planned for the friendships and the relationships and the experiences that I want to have when I don't go to the office tomorrow, or maybe you don't even go to the office anymore because you're doing this. Right. So right. I think that's, that's an actually interesting one. That'd be a, you know, if I was much younger, that'd be an interesting thesis to see what's the effect on retirement for people at the end of their career that no longer go to an office. I bet that would be. That, that would be, that, that would be, that would be really but the thing that really stands out to me too is this idea about doing it your way. I mean, aside from being a Frank Sinatra song, yeah, I was gonna, I can't, I cannot sing by the way, otherwise, I would have sang that. I'm not asking you to sing, I'm not asking you to sing, Joe. I mean, but, but what I'm observing here is this, 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 this idea that, um, you taking more control gradually, however it came about, you know, makes the choices that you make more accountable to you personally, which can be stressful for people, but on the other side of it, people are not making the choices for you, right? You're, you don't have to, your boss says do this, I have to do this, that's the way I live my life. And then when suddenly when you get into the world of retirement, it's much more easy to think that, think that things are outside of your control. And that's one of the, 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 the uh, tropes that we have about senior living and things like that. I'm here because I have to be, you know, I sort of have this learned helplessness. I, I choices are being made for me fine. And that, that leads to a lower quality of life. You're talking more about this opportunity to kind of like take more control again with risk, but also with that reward too. Right. Well, yeah, because any, ch think about it. I mean, if there are some people that I know that have had one job, one company, one career. So the thought of change is really daunting professionally, but for me, I mean, I've been CEO of seven companies. I've lived in Mass. I grew up in Massachusetts, lived in Pittsburgh, lived in Ohio. Now I live in Nashville and Baltimore. So change has been sort of a norm. Um, so I'm like a Gen, Gen Z. No, I think I had this comment. I think, I, I think I'm actually a millennial. You know, I think in, in the way millennials describe themselves in many ways, <laughs> I, I, I think I'm the same way. I mean, I like change. I don't, I don't agree with what I don't agree with and I'm not going to accept it, you know, all that kind of thing. So yeah. I think that, um, yeah, I mean, if it, to me, it's all about being prepared for whatever that new moment's going to be. But if you're not a person that likes to be scared sometimes, like I, I don't like scary movies, but I do like part of my life being a little unclear and a little scary. I like to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I like to, um, you know, have conversations with people that I don't know that well so that they can teach me something and I can maybe be wrong about something. There's nothing better than being informed in an alternative way from someone that I, you know, I don't, I don't know well. So I think it's, that part's really good. 
Yeah, I think that's where we, where I'm also seeing value here, uh, Joe, because you know your methodology you know, take somebody out of an expected environment, put them into an environment that can cue I don't know a different part of the brain, sight, sound, whatever, inspiration. Have conversations with people about them primarily, and just have that discovery. This is what we call you know this is this is what I would embrace under what we call human centered design. You know this this and that's what we aspire to do at United Church Home is just do this co creation with the people. Uh, we aim to serve. And very often when we're talking about older, older adults, these are people that may not have thought that they would have that agency or that the world doesn't think that we should be involving, you know, older people in these discussions. We want to turn that on its head. But you're, you're, you're introducing a really interesting tactic to maybe get at those insights. So where does Dialogue Miles go from here? So it, it, that's the big that's the big opportunity for me. So when 100 Miles of Dialogue started, which ultimately became Dialogue Miles, it was really about saying thank you to a lot of really important people in my life. And um, I'll step back for one quick second. There's a woman that worked for me for years and we met in um, um, New York City right after the pandemic. And we had this conversation. And it was then that I thought, man, I really ought to go do this with a ton of people that I have help for my life. And so I did. And so at the end of that, I just felt like this has become a lifestyle for me now. So I want to help others because I don't know your closest friends and you don't know my closest friends and that's okay, but I would love to go for a walk with you. You know, we could, we could have a different conversation. I'm not recording it. So there are people that do that. I'm not recording it because it's what we want to take away from it is what we share, not some a recording so it's different than this experience mm -hmm. right so dialogue miles is going to be a lifestyle for me i'm going to continue to go forward i'm dreaming about some things right now that i'm not sure about um chloe adams who works with me on a on a daily basis as you've i've introduced you to her before too yeah she's helping me think about because she's younger than me she's in her 20s and so she's thinking about human connection in a slightly different way than i am and there's some opportunities with technology, potentially. There's some opportunities with, um, you know, just not not the randomness, but to scale this in a way that becomes a little bit more predictable. But there will be something, and you'll hear, hear about it in the not-too-distant future, where I can find ways to help other people do what I'm doing in their own way. Because I know I'm a unique person, and I'm a, you know, I have my own approach to things. But I do think... Even if instead of hundreds of people like me, I talk to, even if you had the hope of talking to a few people on the horizon, it could bring joy and it could bring just a, an emotion to you in a very positive way that it would allow you to feel good about the next step you, steps you take in your life. And as long as I continue to do my advisory work, I've also incorporated that in, this into the ideation process within the strategy work that I do, because I've observed this, I don't have statistics to support it just yet, but I've observed that when you send people out of the room in a pair with someone that typically don't talk about, talk to, excuse me, they may talk about them, they don't talk to, they come back with far better insight than if you mm -hmm. just say, hey, chat, because people immediately pick up their phone, go to the bathroom, have a coffee, and they're not really into it, but when they're out on the street or in, in, in nature, yeah. They come back with far better insights. So we're we're doing that too. I love that. I love that. Well, Joe, I it's been terrific to have you on the podcast. Uh, you know, just really breaking down this really cool project of yours that seems to have just a ton of potential. And we always do ask our guests uh, three questions about their own experience with aging. Okay to ask these questions of you? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, first, but can tell our audience where they can find you. Okay. So um, Joe.morgan at safe inspired you.com is my email uh the website is the same safe inspired you.com and linkedin is another another good place to see me and i hope that uh one of those three places will be an invitation for me to take a walk with you absolutely well, I, I would love i would love to do that especially because you said you're in baltimore i'm down here in silver spring maryland far away from not too far away awesome. there's yeah. lots of great trails in maryland for sure. Right. And just for the listeners again, that's safeinspiredview.com, joe.morgan at safeinspiredview.com. All right. So, Joe, question number one. When you think about how you've aged, what do you think has changed about you or grown with you that you really like about yourself? You know, the, the thing that's really important is I have a best friend 
who I've been married to for 41 years. So I walk into the answer to the question with something that not everyone has. So I have, I like that I've been able to adapt as a husband and a friend. I like that about me. I'm not perfect, but I really try hard to adapt. I also think that I've been true to my values throughout the process, which is really, really good. And, the, and your values evolve in terms of their definition, of course, but I've been really true to that. And um, my family matters so, so much. I have a grandson now and I'm going to do some things as a grandfather that I didn't do so, as well as a dad. And so I'm really aware of those things and I'm really trying hard to be um, really effective there. And, and I'd say finally, you know, as a friend, I'm, you know, really trying to be present more than maybe at times I had in the past, because some of my friends are, we would talk about business and now we call each other and we don't talk about business because business isn't centered on it. And I'm still on a faith journey. I continue, I believe deeply in my faith. You can see that behind me. But I, um, it's evolving for me, too, because of the life that I live and the people that I'm around and the circumstances of the, the world we live in. Well, the question number two, though, is what has surprised you the most about you as you've aged? I think I'm getting younger. I really do. I think in a weird kind of way, I may not look that way. In fact, my friends, when they see this, they'll say, you don't look younger. I can't believe you said that, Joe. But inside of me, I do feel that I'm, I'm getting younger and I'm not done. I have so many things that I want to do and I keep planning for things. And I, I really hate the word retirement in the way that it conjured emotions to me. Like I felt it was when I retired, I would be moving to this place where it's just hanging out, you know, watching hoping my money stays enough to let me live the rest of my life. But actually, I'm a lifelong learner. I just love being around young people and people that are different than me. And um, I could tell you so many stories of things that have occurred through Dialogue Miles that have changed my perspective. And um, I think that's the part that really has been confirmed for me. That's awesome. Yeah. And then for our last question, um... Is there someone that's been in your life or someone that you've known that has set a good example for you in aging? Someone where you look at them and I want to be like that person when I grow up, you know, somebody that's inspired you to age with abundance. Yeah. So, so I think there's two parts to the abundance answer. Um, my grandmother lived to be a hundred. She was in the bedroom next to me my whole life. She was my safe place. She was the person that held my hands, looked me in the eye and told me about unconditional love. But I had unconditional love with an expectation. So it wasn't just love and I could do anything I wanted. I actually had to be a good person too. And so she gave that to me. My grandmother was alone. She was the last remaining person in her generation. And she lived in a room by herself. I grew up Irish Catholic. She used to go to confession every Saturday. And I used to wonder, like, what could she possibly have been doing? And it was, I think it was a social thing. She wanted to go talk to the priest because it was a safe place. So you might say... Why would you answer it that way? She was honest and transparent about how she felt about her life always. It didn't turn out exactly as she hoped it would be at the end, but she was honest and transparent about that. So that's, that's how you live with abundance, I think, is you're always honest and transparent. Because we often think about that as being physical vibrancy. I can ride my bike, I can walk, I can, you know, whatever those things are. So there's that. On the other hand, it's my, my friends that I'm close to, I can't pick out just one. It's, it's Chloe, who's, you know, 28 years old, has who we have a bi-directional mentorship where she teaches me and I teach her. It's Kevin Young who hurt his knee and we're going to walk 100 miles together as part of Dialogue Miles. We're going to go from, you know, part of Massachusetts all the way to Portland, Maine. It's, it's every one of those individual stories have formed the patchwork quilt of my life. And so picking only one piece would be really, really hard. You know, I have a daughter who is amazing. She's taught me so much in the last little bit of my life to make me a better dad and a better friend and a better part of her life. I am so blessed that I have that opportunity. And then there's my son and my grandson and my daughter-in-law. So there's not one person, 
I think I'm pulling out little pieces from all those experiences to form my path. And my path is dialogue miles. I love that. I just, I just love that. And I love the, I love how you described it as a patchwork quilt and, and, you know, I just love the, 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 the place you're at right now where you can express gratitude. You can understand the value of honesty, understand the value of transparency. And it's just been such a privilege to talk with you on the show today, Joe. Thank, thank you for making it. Thank you, Mike. No, this is great. I really have enjoyed it. Yeah. I hope that uh, we're going to do that walk too. We are going to do that walk. I'll see you in Silver Spring. Yeah. But you know, I, I have got, I've got to thank somebody else on this podcast and that's the listeners, of course, um, to our listeners. Thank you very, very much for listening to this episode of The Art of Aging, which is part of the Abundant Aging podcast series from United Church Homes. And we want to hear from you. Who's been, had the most influence on your life and inspired you to age with abundance? Um, how do you, um, you know, bring out this just insights with your customers that you, know, you, you, you never thought possible for? What's your technique for that? Um, what do you think of the idea of, um, you know, a dialogue miles where you're just really bringing people out of a usual environment into an unusual environment and getting those insights? We want to hear from you. Uh, so please uh, send us your ideas at AbundantAgingPodcast.com. You can also check out this and other shows on our YouTube channel under United Church Homes. Um, and one more reminder, check out our Ruth Frost Parker Center for Abundant Aging, including our annual October symposium at www.unitedchurchhomes.org slash parker hyphen center. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. <laughs>